people don't understand how important whales are for the ecosystem. Yeah. And so but I think for me, the most important thing is to get the message out there and to do that with social media, to do that with television, to do that with interviews. Welcome to this week's podcast. And for this episode, I am really excited to have my dear friend and dear colleague extraordinaire, Dr. Nan Hauser. Hi, Nan. Hi, Craig. Thanks. <laughs> Nan is a woman of many wonders and splendors and abilities and achievements. It's hard to really encapsulate them all, but she seems to be known mostly as the whale lady is kind of how this happens. And that, that incorporates her science, her ability to communicate, her passion, her understanding for the natural world. But Nan, I'd like to, I'd like to give you the opportunity to say, who, who are you? Just for the world. I mean, you know, I'll, I can talk more about it as we in the discussion about all of your accolades, and I know mm. it's hard to, to talk about yourself, but, but how do you describe yourself in this world? Well, okay. Um, in one sentence, I'm a mother, a grandmother, a nurse, um, Coast Guard captain, a whale biologist, and a few other things in there. An adventurer, I should say. That's amazing, yeah. You know, a lot of people uh, always bring their family in first, and that's great. That's the value <laughs> system, you know. Uh, no matter what someone's achieved, if they've got the Nobel Prize, or the, the Pope, not the Pope, but if they're in some really top position, they often say family first, you know, and I really respect that about you. And I feel like you're my sister, too, by the way. Absolutely, you know, uh, I am. We've, we've known each other for, I don't even want to count the years, but many, <laughs> many decades. And you and I both grew up in New England, and uh, both had a passion for the ocean, and a passion for uh, the Pacific in particular. And it was, it's, it's coincidental and interesting to me that uh, we both ended up in the Pacific. You went to the Cook Islands, mm -hmm. and I went uh, to, the, to New Zealand, and then Kiribati and other islands. And then we stayed there the whole time and kept working yeah. in that region. Now, but, but you've staked out some really unique territory and work and I don't think there's anybody else in the world uh, quite like you. Could you, exp could you explain your research program in the Cook Islands? Um, I studied whales all over the world in the Bahamas and the Eastern Tropical Pacific and Canada and everywhere and then ended up 21 years ago in the Cook Islands, first on Palmerston Atoll and then um, Aitutaki and Rarotonga. And I never really thought about living there, but I was so fascinated by what I was finding and fascinated by the culture and the, the beautiful people that somehow I stayed. I'm still there. And so my project is um, very seri serious science um, and conservation. And so it's population identity and photo ID and genetics, song, the acoustics, all of it is amazing migration and navigation, and my favorite, underwater behavior. I want to go through those topics uh, one by one. Can you just describe where the Cook Islands are? It's, it's for most of the world, okay. a lot of people don't know. Just, just give me a geographical description. Well, Rarotonga is a thousand miles past Tahiti, and it's a thousand miles from Tonga. So it's kind of in the middle of nowhere, and we have 15 little islands that equal 93 square miles of land over 1.2 million square miles of ocean. So they're spread out and it's a great distance between the islands. There's a picture from space. If you approach the Earth at the Pacific Ocean, all you see is ocean. Mm -hmm. And it basically tells you how gigantic the Pacific Ocean is. It's bigger if you put than the, the surface of the moon. It's bigger than the surface of the moon. <laughs> if you put the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean together, they're, they're still much smaller than the Pacific Ocean. And mm -hmm. your islands are kind of, if you look at the Pacific, they're a little bit south and right of dead center, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's where you are. And there are these small islands. They're out in the middle of this vast, wonderful Pacific Ocean, which is the, you know, one of the engines that supports life on the planet. And you staked out a research program there and have been a beacon of information, a beacon of hope, a beacon of, of communication. And you know, one of the things you studied was the navigation mm -hmm. of the whales. And you, had a, you made a discovery, if you could mm -hmm. maybe tell our listeners about it, the, the, the turning thing, which, which yeah. just blew me away when you told me yeah. about that. It blew me away. It still does. I can't take the claim alone by any means. Well, you're very, it, you know, my team and Travis Horton and Alex Zerbini and and others, yeah. and so we put our minds together and found that when a whale leaves Rarotonga, it follows and linear. why are they in Rarotonga in the first place? Well, they come from Antarctica. Okay. What, and they, what so do they do in Antarctica? They eat, and right. they eat, and they eat, and they get fatter and fatter, and they put on 
blubber reserves, right. and then they migrate. Okay. They don't eat for six to eight months. They migrate to the warmer waters of Oceania to mate and give birth. So would you go like a corridor or something? Or? Yeah, we're a corridor, which it, it's surprising that we're not a true breeding ground. They do mate and give birth there, but they're not there for very long, and so it doesn't really fit into the definition of breeding ground. So we are a corridor. They pass through, and they don't stay for long. Okay. And our site fidelity is so low. I mean, we've only had three whales come back in 21 years. Okay. That's just weird because in French Polynesia that doesn't happen, in Tonga and New Caledonia and Samoa and things like that. Though it just doesn't really make sense yet, and so we're looking at that. It's a long-term look. You know, I didn't actually realize that. So it's like a it's like a waypoint on their migration. Yes. So they they fatten up in the Antarctic and all that krill, and then they're heading to their breeding grounds, and then yours is like a it's like a signpost a way a way. Yep. Do you think they use it as a navigation? Is it yes. like okay? I want to get to my breeding grounds, and I got to go here first. Or, yes, well. although, but why don't they pass by there every year, and and we don't know. So it's kind of like a stopover, and it it does make sense that they use these islands as stopovers hmm. and as navigational tools. Hmm. Um, and so the migratory, the corridor, goes through there, and then always to the west. Hmm. And so we don't have whales that go from the Cook Islands to French Polynesia. Hmm. We've only had a couple come from French Polynesia. It's very strange how it all works. But yet I've had a whale travel all the way to New Caledonia, and that was a young female. So why? It wasn't a male seeking a female. And tell our listeners, what, the, what distances are we talking about? Like when they oh, start in Antarctica thousands, and they get to you and they go to thousands. New Caledonia. What, what, oh, tell me these, well, the, it's, if they took a direct route, it would be about 4,000 miles. 4, but they don't miles, take wow. a direct route. Yeah. And then, of course, we found now with satellite tagging and looking at photo IDs across Oceania, that they aren't just coming up and going back again. They're going all through Oceania and not even in straight lines. They're wandering through and spending a lot of time and then going oftentimes all the way to Tonga, past Tonga to the Tongan Trench, and then going back down. So my theory is that they follow the Tongan Trench, the Louisville Ridge, and then the parallel fractures, and then they cut back down to Area 6-1 in Antarctica. Besides looking at the island mm -hmm. going, okay, I know where I am. This Cook Islands. How else do they navigate? What, how do they, I mean, at 4,000 miles, that's a long way to travel. First, let me go back to what we found when they leave, because this has to do with it. Yeah. So when they leave, and we don't know how they get there yet, but they follow this linear constant course segment. Whoa, um, whoa, whoa, hang on. Linear okay. constant course segment. Break that down for me. Okay, a straight line. <laughs> a straight line, okay. So straight, <laughs> yeah. with a heading with that they're following that they don't even deviate by one degree. Wow. And that's with, you know, they can't see it's the bottom. It's hard to do that on a modern ship if you're driving it. Oh, there's with, no yeah. way you could because yeah. there's currents and, you know, all the waves and everything. And they can't, they don't have landmarks. They can't see the bottom. Because they're really in the middle of the open ocean. There's yeah, because we're a volcano. Yeah. Yeah. And so it drops to thousands of meters right, right off us, off the reef. So, so they're following this linear constant course segment, and they are not deviating. In fact, if I put my boat in front of them, they will go under my boat. No kidding. No, it's fascinating. So they're really dedicated to that one direction. Yep. How do they do it? Uh, we don't know. Do they have they a compass must have inside bio... their head or something? Yes, or? yes. And we're looking for the biomagnetite. Okay. Um, it was theorized that it was in the um, dura mater of the brain. And, right. um, <clears throat> and that was kind of disproven when they switched to glass scalpels from metal scalpels. Right. Yeah. So um, well, I'm aware of that in fish. They found a little piece of metal inside the fish's, I think, in the brain somewhere, yeah. and it's it's sensitive to the magnetic fields of the earth, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it works. Does does it work just like a magnet, that, like mm -hmm. a compass we have? Yes. So but if the whale turns a little bit to the right, they'll feel something. Yes. It says no, come back this way. Right. Yes, but we think, and we're working. Well, we've done the paper. We're trying to publish it right now. That it has to do with gravity. And they would sense this gravity somehow with something that's internal in their cells. It's built in somewhere, hmm. a cellular thing. And, you know, do they have ancestral memory hardwired in their DNA? You know, that's another question. And then the biomagnetite. But we see them making calculated turns, mathematical turns, at 23.439 degrees and multiples of that, when the moon changes and we get a different gravitational pull. Wow. Oh, it's fascinating. Yeah. So 
23.439 degrees, of course, is the Earth's axis. It's the tilt of the planet. Ooh. So it's mathematical. So okay. they're doing the celestial navigation using both the sun and the moon. And I mean, it's a lot more complicated. I'm giving you a really basic. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Um, and so we're finding that not just humpbacks do it, but killer whales and turtles and city shearwaters and osprey and there's penguins. You know, we're finding that other animals do it. So to me, it's like this huge breakthrough understanding the master code or something of yeah. navigation. It's, yeah. it's air, land, and sea. It's probably like a gestalt. You know, <laughs> I, know. I mean, I, but by that I mean, it's I not, it's not one thing, it's not two things, it's not three things, it's a whole bunch of things that together give them a, a determined sense of where to go. Do you think they use stars if it's clear? At no, no, I don't personally. Some people do, but I don't. You don't, okay. No. No, they but, can feel it. I don't think they look. No? Um, no. So you think it's a feeling? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's a sensing. No, no, I mean, a sensing. By, by a sensing, a, yeah. a, t a science sensing that, right. that, as you said, is, is connected gravity. to cellular, cellular pulling and gravity yeah. and then, and me <laughs> and then metal. And we do know that animals can uh, aggregate metals in their, in their body through physiology and turn it into an internal compass-like device. I mean, that's been proven. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's a combination. Well, thank you. That's... Uh, Mm. That's really fascinating to ah, me, the precision at which goosebumps. they do this. Yeah, me too. Me too. So, so um, I want to keep, keep working on that. That's my favorite, I think. What, They're all my fascinating your, favorites. Your favorite <laughs> thing is the navigation part. Well, yes, but then I just thought about my experience lately with underwater behavior. Which, yeah, I want to uh, get to that. So that you mentioned that. So what, what I want to set people up, we're going to hear something <laughs> that like blew my mind. And I've been world. studying the as blue world's mind. I think you got like a billion views <laughs> of this of this video, and I'm gonna leave it there. It's a little bit of a teaser of what's coming here. But let, before we get to that experience that you had recently, mm -hmm. which is something that is uh, extraordinary, you said you liked underwater behavior. So what? Mm -hmm. First of all, how do you how do you make the observations, and tell us something about what you've learned? Okay. Well, when I grew up, I spent a lot of time in Bermuda as a child, and I would see the whales go past, and I wanted to know what they were doing underwater. I mean, it's great to see whales from the surface, but I kept thinking, what are they doing? What are they doing when we yeah. can't see them? So everybody laughed at me growing up, saying you can't study whales underwater. It's, it's illegal and you get seasick and you have to get a boat and permits and all that. But I wanted to do it so badly that I do. And I have to say, it's uh, one of the most mind-blowing, fascinating, parts of science that I could ever imagine. I mean, we, it is hard sometimes to interpret their behavior because we can't put our human traits or ideas on them. But all whales have a different personality and every species has a different vibration or just different behavior. And studying humpbacks, there is this incredible respect that they have for us and we have for them. Mm -hmm. And so they've let me into their world, and that's a privilege. And so I've discovered some amazing things between mothers and their offspring. And so do you actually get in the water? I get in the water. So you I do. jump I in and you, and you swim around and you become like them. them. Okay. Yeah. What's that feel like? Home. It yeah. feels. Um, <laughs> I know this kind of sounds kind of silly, but it's almost like going to practice a meditation or have some kind of experience. It's like going to church. You just watch in awe. Yeah. They're so big. Yeah, they're huge. And they open their eye really wide and they look at you. And they know something we don't know. And you try well, what's that? to. I don't know what it is yet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they know a lot more than we know. Yeah. It's just wisdom in their eye. Yeah. It's terrifying, but I'm more terrified of a spider being in my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> I feel a kinship. I feel I've always had a good relationship with animals. My family used to rehabilitate animals, and so we always had wild, crazy animals in the house. And um, so I found a space where we could work together, and I could observe them and film them. People have to understand these are really big animals. Okay, <laughs> really to, to, big. To, I mean, to, it's like what? It's like a school bus. Right? Uh, a yeah, but a fat school a bus. A fat it's school like bus. A, at least a thousand times bigger than you. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, just massive. Their girth is massive. They're, you know, about 50,000 pounds. Yeah, yeah. 
So, and they're Sounds not. Sounds dangerous to me. It is very dangerous, and I don't recommend it to anybody. Yeah. I do have yeah. bumps and bruises and scars and things like that, yeah. but mostly from barnacles, and it wasn't from violent acts or anything. It's just sometimes if you're filming and then a male approaches you from the back, you know, you might slide down. You've actually slid down. And, oh, yeah, and, lots of and, times. And you just slide down. Because they have those big barnacles that yeah. are they're specific to the whale, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're, they live in the... They could cut you up like a razor blade. They do. Yes, I, I have know. scars. Yes, I yeah. know. I know. I've, I've always I've worried about you a little bit in that regard. <laughs> so, okay, so you're swimming around in the open ocean. It's warm water in the Cook Islands. It's good visibility. So you're like in this space. Imagine like kind of a space. Blue space. Outer, outer space. <laughs> and these big, beautiful creatures, big eyes looking at you. And what have you, what have you learned about, about their lives? Just like it doesn't have to be everything you've learned, but just what comes mm -hmm. to mind. Well, I think something really important that people understand is that they need to rest and they need to come up for a breath every 20 minutes. And so they will move a certain distance mm -hmm. and then go down and hang and just sleep and rest. And it's really interesting to watch them rest. I mean, you might have one like this and one like this, and then this one next time the dives will be like this. Mm -hmm. They might be like this. One, this year we had a whale that was always like this, face up sleeping. And they're so beautiful sleeping. That was, I mean, that was just such an interesting thing for me to learn. And then, of course, when they're not sleeping and they're busy traveling, then mm -hmm. that's a whole other thing. They're, um, the male's approaching the female. They're bumping into each other. Sometimes the males will fight. Um, the calves are great. They're, oh my God, I had a calf this year that just circled me and spun around, I mean, for hours, just, who are you? Mm -hmm. You know, they're kind of they're just like little baby Buddhas. <laughs> they, they have no fear. <laughs> and um, so I guess the behavior is, is interesting about how they compete, how they sing, how they approach the female, how they work together. When you see the babies, how old are they? And how Sometimes they're just born. I've seen babies born. Yeah. Well, what do they look like? Squished are they still, up. Are they still wrinkled? Do they have yeah, the, they're wrinkled. The fetal folds? Yeah. They got fetal folds. They're yeah. blue until they come up, shoot up and take their first breath, and they still have an umbilical cord. Really? Mm -hmm. you've, you've even seen it that early? Oh, yeah. No, I've wow. seen them more, and actually, okay. they, and they, they're spastic. Their yeah. central nervous system isn't developed quite right. So they right. come out shaking a little bit? Yep. But how, how soon do they start t taking milk from the mother? I don't know that. I would imagine right away, but I don't know that. And not, we've never seen that right but away. So I've have seen you seen nursing later yes, on? Yes, later on. Now, that, I'm now, sure that, they, now that's an amazing thing in its own right. Mm. Nursing. I mean, think mm. of, you're, you're underwater. Mm. And then whales are mammals like us, so they've got a. How does that work? I mean, how. How, well, does, how does a calf not like just drink seawater instead of the, the... I know, and they can't. They don't drink seawater. They yeah. only drink fresh water. Yeah. So they get the water from the fish that they eat, and so they're not getting water on right. their migration. And the calf gets water, of course, from the mother's milk. So she really has does to... She like, but how does the nursing work? Is so it, they bump up against the mammary slit. There are two mammary slits. The calf stimulates as I want to eat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And he bumps up against it, and a nipple protrudes, yeah. and then it's like a fuel injection of high-fat milk. Yeah. And they wrap their tongues around the nipple. Yeah. It's kind of like little fimbriated edges, so it's like Velcro, and then it's just this fast. Psh. Wow. That's yeah. Cool. Turbo. That's <laughs> Turbo cool. milk. And they have to nurse a lot in the beginning. Yeah. And it's interesting because the mothers will rest because they're really tired. And the calf needs to come up often because his lungs aren't very big. Right. So oh. he comes up to the surface more often. So I can tell how old they are by how often they surface. It sounds to me like your research is you're basically describing the day in the life, so to speak, or the day in the year of, of what they do. Why is that information important? Well, I guess I, I'll just back up for a minute. So we find the whales, we approach them, we count them, we take photo IDs of their tail fluke, and both sides of their dorsal fin and any yep. scarring that they have. And those are like fingerprints, right? You can yep. identify individuals, okay. Yep, put them in the catalog. Um, then we make sure that the whale is very comfortable with the boat, and so we back off for a long time until they are comfortable. And we keep scooping in the footprint to get a piece of skin for genetics yep. and blue carbon and stable isotopes and microbiology, so yep. we get a whole lot just All from the science, that too. Yeah, good. Yep. Yep. All the hardcore science. 
um, drop a hydrophone, see if they're communicating, see if they're singing, that kind of thing. And um, then, if it's appropriate, it's almost like getting an invitation. Then you slide in, or I slide in, and observe. How do you sense an invitation? They come over to the boat and they look at you. <laughs> <laughs> if they take off, you yep. know they don't want you near okay. them. So you don't, I never, I hate that word chase. I never chase a whale. I would okay. never even imagine chasing a whale. We travel with them. We're often in the middle of, oh, the other day we had 14 whales around us. We just traveled with them for hours. So it feels like it's an honor. It is. To, to be invited. They You're invite you into their the, world. Yeah, and, part of the pod. And there are individuals that you know over time. Mm -hmm. And do you think they know you? I do. And uh, how do you think, how, how do you know that? <laughs> I mean, what just, I mean, I know it's, it's, you're a very accomplished scientist, and I, I want that to be clear. But yeah, sometimes, I'm not, sometimes oh, in the world, ooh, there's, ooh. there's other things that give you senses. How do you know they know you? Um, because they come to my boat and they look at me okay. and, um, sometimes they just totally goof on you. They, they, you know, you'd be like, oh, okay, where's the whale? Well, we'll just keep traveling. And then suddenly they'll just pop up right behind you, yeah. two of them. Yeah. And you jump and you, oh, there you are. And they really, I think they have a sense of humor. Yeah. And I think they know that we are there to protect them and that we are there to study them and help them. I think they pick up somehow that our intentions are really clear and really good, and so they allow us to enter their world. Because we've had a, a checkered history with whales, haven't we, as, as a society? Mm -hmm. We've killed millions of them in nice. the days when um, uh, we, we, we killed them for oil at first, mm -hmm. then we started killing them for meat. Globally now, we've basically tampered that down quite a bit. One thing I've, I've always been interested in, Nan, and maybe you could help me with this, is, you know, they're down in the Antarctic for feeding during the Antarctic summer, when there's mm -hmm. a lot of food. Mm -hmm. When the days get shorter and somehow their clock inside says, okay, it's time, we're going to go north. We're going to spend the, the winter in the sun. They do that swim, and then they get to their place where the, you mentioned earlier they fast, and that's where the mothers will give birth, mm -hmm. and then the reproduction begins the cycle again, right? Mm -hmm. So then when that part of their season is over, okay. they swim back to the Antarctic. Mm -hmm. I've always wondered about the calf. How did the calves learn everything? Is it, a, is it in their DNA? Is it taught? Or what, what are you, what well, you thinking about there's that? There's probably some ancestral DNA in their, yeah. I mean, um, memory in their DNA. But yeah. they, the mothers constantly teach the calves, constantly. They teach them how to breach, how to tail slap. I mean, it's really quite funny. The, the calves, when they learn a behavior, they yeah. just love to show off and, <laughs> and do it over and over and over again. And they stick very close to the mother. They have to, otherwise a killer whale or a great white shark is going to come in there. Yeah. Oceanic white dip or something. Yeah. So they, they are very close to the mother, and the mother is very protective, very, very protective of that calf, okay. which is great. And they have different personalities. I mean, one mother might bring the calf over on her head to show us on the boat, and another mother just might say, I'm out of here, and she's gone. Yeah. And so they are constantly learning because what really, I mean, it, this is nature, uh, but I'm very sensitive that they will spend the first year with their mother. They will learn everything about the migration, the navigation, about, and they'll be nursing the whole time. They'll go down, back down to Antarctica a long, long way because they don't, like I said, they follow this migratory corridor through Oceania and then back down. They teach them how to feed, I would imagine. Yeah, they teach yeah. them how to feed mm -hmm. on fish, mm -hmm. krill. Mm -hmm. And then it's they like, Junior, travel. this is your food over here. Yeah. You, get away from that. <laughs> if I have to tell you one more time to not eat that fish, you know, you're in trouble, right? It's like, <laughs> don't eat the octopus. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> and... So then they migrate back up to Oceania, and this is the killer, yeah, yeah. this is the killer, and then the mothers ditch them. So they have this relationship that is like this, like Very our close. relationship with our babies, but it's only for a year, and so then they, Imagine, the mothers huh? go. And I hate it because I get the one-year-olds, you know, the yearlings, yeah. who come to the boat and try to nurse on the side. Oh, and really? I drop the hydrogen, uh -huh. I can hear them crying. They're yeah jaw clapping, and they're kind of like, I'm on my own now. But what the good thing is that all those young animals tend to sort of stick together. 
But yeah. then if a male's trying to sort of hang out, the other males will beat him up and be mean yeah, to him. Yeah, you know, I was, I was studying right whales up in the Bay of Fundy once, and uh, that's a feeding ground, right? So mm -hmm. it's a little bit different in that situation because the mother had to feed, and she couldn't attend to the calf all the time. But the right. calf was still very young because it was early in the season, and he was still nursing. So she had to dive down deep and get her food and l basically leave the calf unattended for 10, 15, 20 minutes. And this particular calf was really got into us and our research oh, boat right. and would come over and always he'd come over like you know, when mom was away and hang around and look at us and you know go around the sides of the boat and then she'd come up after her feeding bout look around where is that oh she'd come over and it would, <laughs> I, I really did feel like she was saying if I've told you once I've they told do. you a thousand times not to play with that boat now come with me <laughs> they and she'd do. drag him off again <laughs> and they, we called him friend I remember we named him friend Aww. but you know earlier you talked about the mothers protecting mm. protecting the calves and that's a thing you see a lot in the animal kingdom, right? You see in the human kingdom. Now you had an extraordinary experience mm. that I referenced earlier. You were protected. Can you, would you, would you honor me and our, our, our listeners and our watchers to tell us what happened to you? Because I've, I've never heard of this before in my life. And well, if it didn't happen to me and if it wasn't on film, I would never believe it. <laughs> I know, I wouldn't either. <laughs> yeah, really. We were making a film and the film director said, um, we need more footage of you with whales underwater. So I said, okay. And I slid over the side, and there were two whales, and one of them had been just great, very friendly, and the other one we didn't really know very well. I stop, and the, if the animal approaches me, it's one thing, but you know, they don't come really close to you, they right. swim by you. Right. So this whale just kept coming and coming and coming and coming and didn't stop, and pretty soon I'm sitting on his head, and I'm like, no, this is not going to happen. This, is, this was different. So I different, put yeah. my hand out to hold myself away from him so I can swim away. But he keeps pushing me and pushing me. So he put me on his head, he rolled over, he put me on his chin, and he kept trying to tuck me under his pectoral fin, which is not a good idea because I just had a snorkel and mask on, and I knew if he, if I got his under pectoral his fin is like a 15 long Oh yes, yeah, three flipper. times longer yeah, it's, than it's me. a gigantic kind of arm thing, yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah, I, yeah. I had never really touched one before. It's really thick, it's is like it? a big, fat surfboard, yeah. but it's three times longer than me. Yeah. You know, they just have to go like that and you're dead because they'll break your bones and rupture your organs. So this went on and on and on and I realized that I was in trouble. But you can't panic with an animal because the animal's behavior will change. So I was terrified without panicking. Is that, yeah. Does that make sense? It, it makes total sense. Okay. And I, I was getting cut up. And so every time he tried to tuck me under his pectrophin, I would either go over or push myself away or hold on to it. So he'd push me through the water. This went on literally for 10 and a half minutes. At one point, he even lifted me up on his pectoral fin out of the water and I yelled to everyone on my boat. And they were crying. I mean, they were panicked. They didn't want to They thought it was the end of you. Yep. Yeah. They didn't even drone because they thought they'd drone my death. They were too terrified to try to get in and do anything. So they, seriously, it was the longest 10 and a half minutes ever in my life. <laughs> and yeah. I just kept focusing on pushing myself away from him and trying to be safe. And then I got a little tiny bit away and I looked over at the other whale because she'd been tail slapping. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know why. And I there was I, an, another huge creature and I thought, oh my gosh, it's a, I seriously thought it was a Xiphias cavarostris, which you yeah, know, I thought yeah, it was a beaked be whale. Beaked whale, yeah. I thought it was a fat beaked whale. And I looked at it and it started swimming towards me. And it wasn't going like this like whales tail, do. It yeah. was going like Sideways. this. And I went, oh my gosh, oh, that is a huge tiger shark. Yeah, very tiger shark. And wow. you know, they're so beautiful, but it's a tiger shark. And I don't, I get out of the water with tiger sharks. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was the biggest tiger shark I'd ever seen. And then I remembered that everybody on the boat had seen a tiger shark yesterday, but me. They were all like, oh my God, did you see how big that shark was? And so anyway, there he was. And I, so I yelled, there's a tiger shark, tiger shark right there. And then I started swimming closer to the boat because the whale kept getting me closer and closer to the boat, pushing, pushing, pushing me on his head. I mean, seriously, on the front of his rostrum even, just little tiny me, you know, me. And then this huge whale just pushing me. And he pushed me right to the boat. Right to the boat. And then I climbed up on the ladder and Alyssa, my research assistant, went, Nan, look, and he was just right here making sure he was protecting me, and I got up on the boat, and it's still, I started to laugh, 
and and go oh my gosh and then I started to cry it was just this emotional thing I can't even express what the feeling was and then I remembered that Bob Pittman had written these papers about altruistic behavior in humpback whales that they will protect other species and they will put them under their pectoral fin seals um, smaller whales, larger whales even. Um, so the whale was saving you from possible threat or danger yes, from the tiger shark. Yes. Just like it would its own calf. Yes. Was it the or same? another species. Or another species. And, and doing it to another species is just, it's, yes. it's a mind boggling concept really. Yes. And I had never heard of them doing it to a human. I, ha I haven't either. Never. There's some stories of dolphins supposedly mm. uh, assisting drowning sailors at sea, yep. uh, which I've heard of, but I've never heard anything about a, of a no. whale protecting somebody from a potential threat. You know, now, to make it clear, you know, tiger sharks are big, they can be aggressive, but they're not always dangerous to people. No. They always like, try to dispel the myth that sharks are, right. uh, no, I, are, I are sharks. dangerous all the time. I love <laughs> sharks. They're always, a, they're always a high point of my diving if I see a yeah. shark. However, you have to keep you have to keep your wits <laughs> about you. You have to you know get those eyes in the back of your head going and be careful because they could mistake you from something that they would want to eat. Yes. And any number of things could happen. So that whale was doing you a service, and what an amazing story! We'll direct people to your to your video so they can actually see what you just described. Now, yeah, but there's an update video. to this too, right? Yes, there's an update which I have not even told anyone okay, or so put on news. social media yet. Yeah. No, this is, you're the first. Okay. Thank you. I was blown away by this experience, as was the world, and the, I mean, the messages that I get are, of course, the whale saved you. You've been protecting the whales and saving the whales for 28 years, which ah. is interesting. <laughs> and I think about that whale a lot, a whole lot. I never saw him again. He took off. Does he have a name? No. We're going to yeah. auction off the name because he's okay. a very special whale and he needs a very special he name. He's a very special name. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, when we first see a whale, we... We name him something that's distinguished, a, a characteristic about him, and he has a very um, falcate and high dorsal fin, so we could just call him can opener for, for identification yeah. purposes. And um, so I think about him a lot, yep. and when I look at the footage, I just can't even believe it. So this year, had a great whale season, started late, very late. It didn't start till middle of August. Um, had great whales, great season, and um, one year and 15 days later after this experience, so it was September 29th, we were further around the island and couldn't find much, and someone called us and said there was a whale off the harbor. So we went back up, and we were behind him, and I, someone said on my boat, oh, strange dorsal fin. Didn't think anything of it. And then uh, he fluked, and I took a picture. And then I went, that's weird, because he's got two V gouges, one on each side of his tail fluke. And so I got out my phone and looked up the tail fluke of this whale from last year. And then I looked at my camera, and I went, I can't say for sure, but I, and I won't believe it because this would be the third whale that ever came back in 21 years. Okay. But it might be him. And then um, he went and he slept, as they do. And then he came up to the boat and he swam right up. Mm -hmm. And then he just stared at me. He paid no attention to anyone else on the boat. He just stared at me. And then I saw his white patch. And then I saw this mark that he has on the front of his rostrum. And I screamed. I literally screamed. I screamed, oh my God, you're back, you're back. What are you doing, you're back. The one that saved you the year before. Yeah, wow. I was just blown away. It was him, it was him. And he dove and I slipped in the water and I, it was very murky there, but I filmed him sleeping. He was really funny sleeping, what a strange whale. His head was almost on the reef. Just, he wasn't touching the reef, but he was like, wow. <laughs> sleeping upside down. and. Then he woke up and he swam up to me and he stared at me and I put my hand out on uh -huh. his face like yeah. this, yeah. No, big face. Yeah. Yeah. And he kept nudging me with his head. He recognized me right away. Wow. And so 
we just had this encounter that was, I guess it's probably pure unconditional love. You know, how else do you explain it? Yeah. And he was very gentle, but it was, it wasn't like, hi, my old friend. It was like, oh my God, hello. <laughs> <laughs> it's you. He felt you like it was a little bit of yeah, excitement. So he put me out of yeah, his yeah. spectral fin and he was like, woohoo. Wow. I, I wow. just held on. Wow. And then he like kept nudging me some more. And I held on to his tubercles on his face, which is really amazing because I'm studying tubercles mm -hmm. because I think they have mm -hmm. to do with migration and navigation mm -hmm. and there's little fibrosa coming yeah, out. Yeah. So I'm holding on to them on his face. And uh, yeah, we just had you know, this incredible welcoming. Wow. It brings to mind, you know, how, how rarely we have any significant interaction with a wild animal. Mm. And you've had that, you've had the honor of that. Of course, we've domesticated animals all over the place, and cats, dogs, and whatnot. But this wild animal uh, interaction is, is, really, is really quite fascinating to me. And it gets to our whole relationship with the wild animals. And there's a great writer, Henry Beston, who wrote about this. And I don't have the quote here in front of me. I didn't think of it till just now. But, mm -hmm. but he basically says, we judge animals the wrong way. They have senses that we have lost or never attained. They live by voices we will never hear. Mm. And then he says, they are not underlings and they are not brethren. They are other nations caught with ourself in the, in, in the joy and travail of the earth. I love it. Isn't that a great way to describe it? Because we do tend to diminish animals if they don't have what we think is important. Mm -hmm. If they can't write books, <laughs> if they can't mm -hmm. recite poetry, if they can't uh, do those sorts of things, or we, we, we elevate them too, too high or we, or we think they're just like us. And they're, they're not just like us. Mm -hmm. you know, their world is, is a world we can't imagine. Your friend that you haven't named yet senses the world in a certain way, in a way that we can probably never imagine. Yet he knew who you were. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he sensed that you were a being that needed potential protection from that shark. And then he remembered you a year later. I mm -hmm. mean, it's really, really quite an extraordinary story. Mm -hmm. The whole topic of whale intelligence and marine mammal intelligence interests a lot of people. There's been quite a bit of research done on it. And the dolphin community, uh, which I've studied a lot, have particularly developed cerebral cortex, you know, the part of the brain that we normally associate, that we associate with reasoning and forward thinking and planning and a sense of ourselves. Mm. The bottlenose dolphin in particular actually has a larger cerebral cortex than us relative to their body size. And that uh, inspired a lot of work in the 60s and 70s about, oh, maybe we can talk to these animals somehow if we could break the code. Mm -hmm. But therein we erred because mm -hmm. they don't necessarily communicate like we communicate right. and have a, have a conversation. They have a different sense of it. And I was part of a program where we were doing metacognition with dolphins and teaching them words and then syntax. And that was, it was really interesting. I mean, they, yeah. they showed huge intelligence. It's harder to measure the intelligence of these greater whales, these humpback whales. Although, I see them as these incredible sentient beings, <laughs> and I think that I mean it, you also have to go back to how do you how do you really define intelligence? Is right. it learning something and then internalizing that and then being able to retain that information and bring it up when you need it in a survival situation mm -hmm. or, or whatever? And so yes, of course they have all of that, and they. They've survived for so long. I mean, look at the beaked whales, 50 million years or whatever, and, and even humpbacks, mm -hmm. so many millions and millions of years. So that right there is incredible intelligence and to navigate the way they do. But, you know, I want to bring up song too with humpbacks because what we did is took 775 songs, broke them up into phrases, and then to, gave to each phrase tell a color. Tell what a song is. Because a lot of um, people only, too, okay. may not know what that is. Humpback whales sing songs. They actually sing songs. Yeah that are repeated over and over again and it's a different song in every area and then it actually changes every year and all the whales in a certain area sing the same song and it's about well, 16 to 20 minutes long it's made up of phrases mm -hmm. and it's beautiful it's, it's only the males right yep only the males sing yeah. the somehow females related vocalize. to attracting chicks yeah, yeah. attracting females well that, that's you know roger payne theorized yeah. that in yeah. 1972 yeah. Yeah. and then there's this whole thing about dominance and a male joiner coming in and then both singing and comparing song and saying, uh, I can sing 
better, I have bigger lungs, right, I can hold my right. breath longer, I can sing a more beautiful song. I'm the more dominant maybe male. Maybe the female so could assess the health and the vitality of the male mm. by how he sang. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah, definitely. And so anyway, we broke these songs up, took the phrases, gave them colors, and found that literally these humpback songs are being passed from Western Australia to Eastern Australia to New Caledonia to Tonga, Samoa, Cook Islands, French Polynesia. Wow. It's a ripple. It's horizontal cultural transmission. Uh, that's rippling across Oceania, and then the one of the phrases is actually starting to bounce back again and come back. So there's got to be data in there. These animals are really intelligent. There's got to be data. I mean, what else could this be? So it's not just telling the females they're there. It's not just saying I'm the more dominant animal. They're talking about something that we don't understand, and they're passing it across a huge ocean basin. Wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. What could it be? I mean, do you have, I mean, is it, they talk about the weather, they talk about the weather, or the, the feeding grounds, the migration, the, the, you know, how many fish there were, what's uh -huh. safe, what's not safe, I, that would be I mean, who knows, it's who knows, you know what, I can't even theorize, because it's probably something we don't know or understand ourselves. Yeah, I want to come back to sleeping, too, for a minute, you okay. talked about that quite a bit, yeah. not to mention this fact, something I like to do, <laughs> uh, the whales sleep, you said, underwater. But as I recall, they, don't, they never really sleep like we do, right? right? They, could you describe what it's like for a whale when they're sleeping, what's going on? Yeah, well, well a dolphin, we know that a dolphin sleeps on one half his brain while right. he uses the other, and then he switches over. We don't know that a whole lot about the humpbacks, but we do know <laughs> that they need to rest. I mean, they've made this huge migration, and they rest. And oftentimes, they'll just be in a position, and they won't move. But they're kind of aware of what's going on around they're them. They're aware. They're yeah. always aware because if you dive too close to them, yeah. they, there must be some electromagnetic field or something, or they, they must hear everything, you know, yeah. every ripple. Mothers sometimes who are so exhausted will sleep longer, and you can see them open an eye and kind of look at you, <laughs> and they don't care. They're like, yeah. just swim mothers, around mothers me. Mothers everywhere. I don't care. Yeah. Like yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Would, would you liken whale sleeping to, like, Imagine a Saturday afternoon where you lay down on the couch and you close your eyes and you're kind of resting. <laughs> right. And you're kind of aware of everything that's going on, but you are getting some rest. But, yes, but, you, but, but when something happens, your eyes are open right away. It's yes. not like, it's, is, it, is it that kind Yes, of I would think okay. that it is definitely And they also that have voluntary breathing too, don't they? That is, they yeah, have to, they have they have to, to consciously think breathe. About, yeah. Whereas we don't. No, we just breathe, but they have to consciously think about coming up for breath. So if we lie down and when we go to sleep, our body kicks into gear and it just breathes on its own. But a whale has to Wake consciously up. think and breathe. So if it's not, if it's not conscious, it, can't, it won't breathe. So they are conscious 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, right? Yes. And it's that, to me, that's always been a fascinating kind of idea because sleep yes. is such a big part of our world. But of course, they need sleep. We mentioned earlier a little bit that the history of our relationship with, with whales and most wild animals has not mm -hmm. been a particularly stellar one. We hunted whales. What can we do as a society or as individuals to, to help these animals? And what are, what's their, mm -hmm. what are the threats in the going forward? You know, I think, let's mm -hmm. put whaling aside for now. Let's, let's say we've sort of got that under control. What do whales have to worry about now and what can we do about it? What I think about so often is uh, the nets, the even the long lines, the calves. I, I filmed a calf for six days one time a couple of years ago, and then it got caught in a long line 12 miles out and drowned, and it killed me. And oh. um, But th it probably happens all the time. Yeah. We just happen to know that it happened then. So um, there are so many nets set in this migratory corridor, and... That's why satellite tagging is so important, that we know exactly where they go and tell the fishermen, make it, you know, put it through legislation that they set their nets somewhere else during mm -hmm. the migration. And, you know, it's the, the food that they eat, how mm -hmm. toxic with the currents are mm -hmm. those fish. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the organohalogens, the Myrex, the, the PCBs, the mm -hmm. DDT, all that. Pollution, yeah. Yeah, the, I mean, there's tons of it, and the fish are polluted, and then they're not you know, they're fat soluble, so they stay in the body, they stay in the blubber. So looking at the toxicology and how that affects their immune system and their reproductive system and all that. And, you know, now they're telling us not to even eat a lot of the fish because we're eating plastic. So how yeah. is that affecting the whales? How's it affecting their personality? How's it affecting their health? And noise pollution, 
and that's a big and one. Noise pollution. Yeah, These animals live one. in an acoustic world, don't they? They, yes. they listen and they're very good listeners and everything. For communication and reproduction and feeding and everything. It's very, very serious. They're still hunting. I mean, we're still on the endangered species list. We're the last of the migratory population that's still endangered of hump, the humpbacks. Are they being hunted somewhere, humpbacks, currently? Well, they're not supposed to be, no. Uh -huh. And yet, our team has gone to um, Japan in the past and bought whale meat at the market and then sequenced the DNA right there in oh, the so hotel room. Illegally Scott hunted. Baker. Yeah. Okay. So I even found horse so meat. There's some, so there's yeah, some there's illegal hunting going on that's been yes. detected. Okay, we got to yes. crack down on that. And you know, a big fear is global climate change. If their food source changes where it is, the location, how do the whales know where to go? Are they going to have enough food to eat? Are whales skinnier now? Yes, some of them. Hmm. So have they been feeding um, where hmm. the, the krill are not as abundant? Have the krill moved? Have the herring moved? You know, it's all just this yeah. imbalance right now. So how do they know where to go to feed? Whales are an incredible bioindicator of climate change. And I think that we should probably use yeah. them for that. And Any animal in the ocean, whether it's in it or on it, birds above it, whales in it that migrate long distances. Mm. I figure if you are able to keep that system going, keep them healthy on both ends, keep the, the ecosystems going on both ends, you're actually maintaining the ocean health over that distance, mm -hmm. right? And that's almost like an indicator of, of ocean health. If the animals are happy, if the animals are the right weight, the ocean's able to optimize mm -hmm. the operating system of the ocean. And I think whales are a great indicator. I think seabirds are. I think tuna are. Yes. I think various things are. And you know, the world's moving through um, transformation, I like to call it the ocean renaissance now, where we're finally getting it right, I hope. Uh, I'm very optimistic, and I know you are too. And it's one of the reasons that we've, we've um, been such great friends and, and colleagues all, over all these years. Well, what's next for you? What's, what's on your horizon, man? Right now, I think the most important thing is satellite tagging and, and following these animals and seeing if we can find them the safe migration route mm -hmm. to protect them and understand exactly how we're affecting them and how we can make them healthy. This whole trophic cascade thing about why whales are important is so interesting and how, I know it sounds crazy, but when whales poo, it's just this incredible fertilization for the ocean and yeah. for life to continue. And we call them poonamis, actually, yeah. that's great. And people don't understand how important whales are for the ecosystem. Yeah. And so but I think for me, the most important thing is to get the message out there and to do that with social media, to do that with television, to do that with interviews, to go out. I love teaching, I, to go out and give presentations everywhere and all over the world and, and talk to other people. We need to collaborate. It's time to collaborate. Well, I agree. I, what I'm hearing from you is... We need to learn, keep learning more about where the whales go and maintain the ocean health around those pathways, mm -hmm. those long pathways. And then you said, you know, communicate. And it's almost like you're the ambassador from the whales now. They've, they've anointed you. Oh, you've, been, a, you've been, you've been, you've been, you know, I mean that. You know, they, you, you've, you've, you've developed this relationship with not just that one whale, but with all of them. Mm -hmm. And now it's important for you to go out and you're their voice in a way, I think. That's my view. Yeah, no, I've always felt like I'm the voice like, for you're, them. You're, you're like a, you've been appointed, anointed <laughs> by the whales to be that. And I, and I thank you for your work and, and all that you do. You know, and same it, you, to you. You inspire me. Is there anything else that you'd like to say to our listeners about, about the ocean or about anything? And do you, it's all right if you don't. No, no, no. I, I would like to say that um, another, I'd like to talk about an encounter that I had on my birthday last year year where the other whale that was there for that encounter um, came to the boat four days later and it was my birthday and she kept spy hopping so I got in the water with her and she dove and she came up and it's all on film she came up with her peck fins out and she put them around me I got a whale hug on my birthday and I cried so hard and you know again I'm this hardcore scientist yeah you are and this emotional thing that went on I felt like this is just you know the the push of yes I've always done as much as I can do but I need to do more we all need to do more okay. we need to do it now it was a message that said to me yeah I've been dedicated and all this and I spent my life doing this but Nah, we can no, do more. I, I'm we have you, to. I'm with you there. We've identified the problems. We actually know the solutions now too, which is the, the wonderful part. But we are not 
in high gear mm -hmm. at, at implementing them. And we need to get the world really going. It has to be an all-in effort, you know, mm -hmm. and it can't just be, uh, I recycle my paper. Right. And I it's, drive an electric car. Right, Do right. that, please. Everybody keep doing that. But it, it's much more urgent. Bigger. Than that. It's much more urgent. And you're, uh, you're one, of my, one of my heroes. So thank you. Thank you, Nan, for Thanks, spending this sweetie. time and sharing everything with everyone. All right? Yeah. Appreciate well, we have it. to remember the ocean is the amniotic fluid for all of us. Am, I, that's, a, that's a nice place to stop on. The, amni the amniotic fluid for the universe. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks.